Hello, friends. I've uh, just decided uh, to make a little uh, PR video of a translation which I made last year, completed last year. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm going to share the web page uh, about it. So, there it is. Um, Eight Steps to Build an Invincible Team, a Rugby Coaching Bible from Japan. Um, I should explain uh, that it's by Toshiyuki Hayashi. It's translated from the Japanese. Um, and actually, I probably should uh, you know, just briefly stop sharing to show you the original Japanese book, which is that one. Okay, and there is Hayashi-san on the front cover. Okay, now let's go back to sharing then. Um, if I can find where to do it. Yeah, that's it. Share the screen. Good. Okay, so this um, web page which I created, uh, uh, here's the URL which I, I will put in the... Um, description of this YouTube video um, and uh, uh, it sort of go it uh, just briefly mentions myself and then introduces Hayash Sam's very illustrious and distinguished career in rugby uh, and then there's uh, an introduction uh, written especially for the translation by Ian Williams, friend and teammate of Maru Hayashi. And the whole book is there in PDF format and uh, translation bit, uh, in bits is there as well. Um, reasons for translating. Oh gosh, we're exactly on 1,400. That's interesting. <laughs> I, hadn't, uh, I hadn't realized that. Um, so yeah, the the Japanese book is available on amazon.co.jp and the Japanese publisher said it would be all right to publish on, publish this uh, translation on the internet as long as it is free. So this is indeed free. Um, I have no idea if it may end up in a book somewhere uh, as a paper book rather than just uh, something online. Uh, it's really out of my hands. Um, as far as I can tell. Uh, so, um, without further ado, I would just like to, well, let's go back up to the top of this page, shall we? There we are. We've got Hash San and the title. And uh, I'm going to read parts of, parts of the book just to give you a flavor of it. Uh, so, here we go. Uh, oops, no, that's not what I intended. I wanted, didn't want to sh share this, but I suppose I can. Yeah. Um, okay, fair enough. Uh, well, uh, first of all, what have we got? They've got the. Whoops, sorry. The contents page with my acknowledgements um, about the author, Ayashi San. Introduction by Ian Williams, and then the forward and eight steps, as, as you can see there, um, and the postscript. Okay. Um, I shall skip the my, my comments, acknowledgements, and I, I think I will also and uh, i just go briefly through here, Toshiyuki Maru Hayashi. Uh, and then the introduction. I will start to read the introduction by Ian Williams, who is from, who is an Australian uh, and former teammate of Maru Hayashi. So here we go. Introduction to Eight Steps to Build an Invincible Team. Toshiyuki Maru Hayashi is the most unique person I have met in my 30 plus years of association with Japanese rugby. 
There are many facets to the former Japanese Brave Blossoms captain and holder of 38 test caps, the highest at the time of his retirement, one over 13 years, 1980 to 1992. Oxford Blue, Barbarian, seven-time All Japan champion, chairman and founder of not-for-profit Youth Rugby Foundation Heroes and well-known motivational speaker. We first met in May 1987 in Sydney at a dinner organized by Kobe Steel during the inaugural World Rugby World Cup. Maru was the captain of Japan, and the team included three other Kobe Steel players, Seiji Hirao, Atsushi Oyagi, and Mitsutake Hagimoto. I had won a scholarship to Oxford University sponsored by Kobe Steel, so there was a connection. Conversation at the dinner was difficult as I spoke no Japanese and the players did not understand my Aussie English. At the time, I had little knowledge of Japanese rugby other than playing against the Japanese schoolboys team, which toured Australia in 1981. And as a schoolboy watching flying Japanese winger Masaru Fujiwara score for a World 15, playing Sydney at the Sydney Cricket Ground. The popularity of Japanese rugby was a well-kept secret to the outside world. Japan played exceptionally well against Australia, uh, 23 to 42, poorly against England, 7 to 60, and lost a heartbreaker against the United States, 18 to 21. Next time I met Maru, I was playing for Oxford University on a pre-season tour to Japan in September 1988. He captained Japan in the test match to celebrate the reopening of Prince Chichibunomiya Stadium in Tokyo. That's the same Prince Chichibunomiya Stadium, which is now likely to be demolished <clears throat> in the plans for the renovation of the Meiji Shrine Outer Garden, the Gaien. Incredibly, when you think Japan was a World Cup 2019 quarter finalist and is ranked as one of the top 10 teams in the world these days, Oxford defeated Japan by 23 to 12. In fairness, the Oxford team were almost entirely postgraduates and contained an all-black World Cup winning captain David Kirk, four Wallabies, Troy Coker, Rob Egerton, Brian Smith and me, and a Welsh international, Di Evans. Later that night, after dinner and far too many bever beverages with Sokichi Kametaka, then president of Kobe Steel, I agreed to join Kobe Steel after graduating from Oxford. Maro and I were to be teammates. I arrived in Japan in September 1989 to work and play rugby. All the leading teams were owned and managed by major companies, Toshiba, Santori, Nippon Steel, Rico, Toyota, Honda, Sanyo, now Panasonic. There were 24 teams in the first division split across Kanto, Kansai and Kyushu regions, and another 24 teams in the second division, right down to eight teams in the fifth division in the Tokyo area competition. The number of teams and the professional training and playing facilities were light years ahead of Australian rugby. The All Japan final between the company champion and the university champion teams attracted 65,000 people at the old Tokyo Olympic Stadium. Wow. By contrast, the famous 1987 World Cup semi-final between Australia and France was played at Concord Oval in Sydney in front of 20,000 people. There is no history of sport as Westerners would understand the word and no indigenous team sports in Japan. In fact, there is no word for sport in traditional Japanese language. The closest is taiku, which roughly translates to physical exercise. The purpose of sport in Japan is not for recreation or enjoyment, but to improve the body and soul through repetitive, hard training. I think that's where I've been going wrong all these years. <laughs> Martial arts such as sumo, kendo, and judo embody the important elements of bushido, or the way of the samurai, Loyalty, honor, duty, obedience, du uh, loyalty, honor, duty, obedience, duty, my goodness, we've got duty twice. <laughs> Self-sacrifice, sincerity, self-discipline, humility, and modesty. Some commentators feel, however, that one reason for the relative historical popularity of rugby in Japan compared to some other Western team sports is that the values traditionally associated with the game, team spirit, gentlemanly conduct, one for all, all for one, resonated with the samurai values first shown to the rest of the world by Nitobe Inazo's Bushido, The Soul of Japan, published in English in 1899. Maru is the only modern-day samurai I have met. 
His spirit is as pure as the Hokkaido snow, and his toughness legendary. He played rugby with every sinew of his body and every ounce of strength and passion, wearing his iconic white scrum cap with the string on the wrong side of his chin, just under his bottom lip. Some players played in a way to appeal to the media or for themselves to shine, but never Maru. He always played for the team and was always the first to do the hard work the outside backs disdained. He was a powerful runner with the ball in hand, a fierce, fearless defender, a great scrummager and the architect of the bullet throw at the front of the lineout, which dominated at club and at international level for many years. In the 1980s and early 1990s, the wall was a favourite attacking ploy from tap penalties close to the goal line, where three or four players would turn their backs to the defence and the ball would be concealed momentarily. Mara's approach was simple. He would sprint directly at the wall, then throw himself sideways into the legs of the opposition forwards, knocking them over like bowling pins. Personally, I have a debt of gratitude to Maru that I will never be able to repay. In the 1991 Japan Championship final, we were losing to Sanyo by 12 to 16. Sanyo had thoroughly outplayed us, but had missed five kicks and failed to close out the game. In the third minute of injury time, we attacked from our own 22-meter line. A ruck formed and our number eight, Ippe Onishi, went by himself on the blind side and was taken in a tackle by three defenders. Somehow Maru got to his feet from the middle of the last ruck and drove in hard and cleaned out the defenders and the ball was presented perfectly. Two Hail Mary passes later, I was on a 60-metre run to win the game, 18-16, and Kobe Steele's third championship in a row. Ultimately, Kobe Steele won seven consecutive championships and over 70 consecutive games. The dramatic Sayonara last play win by Kobe Steele is still fresh in the minds of Japanese rugby fans and made me a minor celebrity in Japan. I still have Japanese acquaintances wanting to talk about it 32 years later, and it's cemented a lifelong connection with Japan. There are many wonderful stories of Maru, and below are a few I have enjoyed over the years. In the semi-final of the 1986-1987 Company Championship, Kobe Steele with Maru as captain played Nippon Steel Kamaishi. At full time, the scores were tied at 9-9, and rather than play extra time or have a replay, the winner was decided by lottery. The two captains played a junken, a single game of rock, paper, scissors, to decide who would select the envelope first. Maru unfortunately lost the junken, and the Nippon Steel captain selected the correct envelope, and they progressed, progressed to the final. The following season, at the end of training, when the team would practice personal skills, it was humorously suggested that Maru should focus on practicing his junket. On a more serious note, one of the other foreign players' greatest memories of Maru is from his first Hanami cherry blossom party at Ikuta Jinja Shrine in Kobe. He could understand very little Japanese, but was enjoying the amazing camaraderie. Towards the end of the afternoon, Maru sang a song solo, which sent a shiver down his spine and he noticed that everyone around had a tear in their eye. Maru was singing a pre-flight Kamikaze, Cherry Blossom Boys song. Maru entered Oxford University to study for a postgraduate diploma in social studies and joined the Oxford rugby team. Rather than play in the second row, he was converted into a prop and became the first Japanese to win a rugby blue from either Oxford or Cambridge. In the locker room before the 1990 varsity match, the team formed a tight circle and Oxford captain Mark Egan was about to start his pre-match speech when there was gutturals, a guttural scream followed by intense wailing from Maru. Mark gave up his prepared speech and said, look at what this game means to Maru. The first scrum of the game collapsed and Maru dislocated his kneecap. Irish international referee Owen Doyle was very concerned as Maru lay prostrate on the ground. Rather than leave the field for medical attention, two of the Oxford players, Dr. Errol Norwitz, an obstetrician and gynaecologist, and Dr. Andrew Everett, a family physician, put his knee back in place. Maru then played a pivotal role in an upset 21-12 win by Oxford over a star-studded Cambridge team. The high regard in which Maru was held as a player is reflected in his being the first Japanese to play for the world-famous Barbarians Football Club in 1992 on a tour to Russia. In the 1992 off-season, Maru organised an exhibition match against Suntory, who had been our opponent in the company semi-final a few months earlier, in his hometown of Tokushima on Shikoku Island. 
Shikoku is the smallest of the four main islands which comprise Japan and very much the most rural. When we arrived in Tokushima, there was a reception in the city hall and Maru was honored as a returning hero. From then on, we used to joke, joke that he was the king of Tokushima, like Aragorn in The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. One of Maru's main passions is the future of Japanese rugby and in particular the under 12 age group or primary school level. In Japan, up until 15 years ago, organized competitions for primary school level were rare. There was a big gap in the developmental pathway at the junior level. As a response, Maru founded the Heroes Cup, a not-for-profit organization. From humble beginnings, it now boasts that the numbers and reputation of arguably being the biggest primary school level national tournament in the world, with over 5,000 junior rugby players, 290 rugby schools, and numerous events and qualifying tournaments throughout Japan, and an army of 2,460 volunteers activated by the passion and drive of their leader. The Heroes Cup embodies everything that is good about rugby, the all-for-one philosophy of camaraderie, respect, honesty, and friendship. Mara's dream continues to grow, and the Heroes Cup now can proudly boast young players that have come from this grassroots event into high school rugby, university rugby, and then into the Japan Professional League and National Honours. There is no doubt that Hero Heroes Cup will form a very large part of Maru's legacy. His ability to activate, enthuse, drive, and support people from all walks of life shows no bounds, and he continues to work tirelessly for the Heroes Cup. Many rugby players struggle to adjust to life after rug rugby mentally, emotionally, and financially. Rugby has been their identity for so many years, and suddenly it is gone. Rather than staying at Kobe Steel head office, I admire Mara's decision to follow his passion and join a subsidiary company focused on corporate leader leadership development and training. His motivational speeches are legendary, and the passion he shows is genuine and from his soul. Business people are always impressed by his ability to distill the underlying principles of success on the rugby field and apply them to business, teamwork, commitment, dedication, resilience, perseverance, like a modern-day samurai. Ian Williams, Brisbane, Australia, January 2023. I would like to thank former Kobe Steel colleagues Hal Cochran, Reg Clark, Mark Egan and Simon Wensley, and also Mara's close friend Peter Gibson for their contributions to this introduction. Uh, and indirectly, so would I. Um, so that's it. Uh, I'm not going to give any more at the moment, but I just thought I would uh, uh, prepare this uh, and put it on my YouTube channel. Uh, so there we go. Thank you very much.